Do I want to start? Yes, I do. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good lunchtime. Hello, this is day three of the Falls Awareness Week webinar series um, from the Falls Prevention Network. Welcome all. Um, we've got 126 people at the moment. I'm sure that will go up and um, recording has already started and will be available after this has finished um, sometime next week. So quick introduction to myself. I'm Neil, Neil O'Halloran from Medline Clinical Support, who also runs the Falls Prevention Network. If you want to join and um, have free access to meetings and networking with 800 or more fellow colleagues, please contact me uh, for either through Twitter or my details come up at the end of the presentation. Well, I'm also ably supported in the background. You won't necessarily see them is uh, Simon in marketing and who's going to be helping run the Q&A box. All cameras are off at the moment, so we can't see you and the microphones are off, so you can say what you like. And what we will do, as I said, we're recording it now. Housekeeping, if you need to go to the toilet, don't pause the presentation because we all we have to wait for you to come back. Um, if you want to get up and exercise, please do in light of the deconditioning uh, aspect of this week. We just thoroughly encourage you to do some exercise while you're watching. Um, the Q&A box will be running on the right hand side of the screen. Use that for popping your questions in. We'll have a look through and if you like things as well that people are writing, then have a little like onto that and that way we'll know which of the popular topics that we can cover at the end. Uh, also, we're on at Falls underscore network if you're on Twitter and so if you want to join the network, then details will follow. So with no further ado, I want to welcome Dr. Toby, jo Toby Jones. Toby Jones. Not quite. Toby <laughs> Elmus, um, PhD. He's a Sir Henry Welcome Research Fellow in the Centre for Vestibular Neurology at Imperial College London. It took me ages to learn that one. Um, and his research explores how psychological factors, specifically fear of falling and anxiety, influence balance, walking and mobility in clinical populations. He is also a member of the Fear of Falling Working Group within the World Falls Guideline Initiative. More on that to follow, I'm sure, and regularly lectures on these uh, these topics. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Toby. I shall now put his little face in the side. And move you over there. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for the very nice introduction, Neil, and thank you for the invitation to come and speak today. So my name's Toby Elmers and I'm a research fellow at Imperial College London. As Neil said, I'm also part of the Concerns or Fear of Falling Working Group for the World Falls Guidelines. So I'm not actually going to be presenting um, about this today because there is currently an, an embargo on these recommendations, but these recommendations will be published at the end of the month in Age and Aging. So Please do keep a lookout on that because there will be some really nice recommendations about fear of falling, but then about preventing falls in general. So today I'm going to talk to you all about fear of falling. We're going to talk about the causes, what the consequence of fear of falling are with respect to balance and falls, as well as some applied recommendations. So normally when I'm doing face to face talks about fear of falling, I like to start by just asking people in the audience to put their hands up if they have experience working with someone with balance problems or someone with mobility problems who have disclosed to them that they are fearful of falling. And normally what you see is a, a sea of hands going up, which I think really nicely illustrates the importance of considering fear of falling, the importance of considering some of these psychological constructs in falls prevention. But despite this, fear of falling is typically it tends to be actually overlooked rather with people focusing instead on physical and physiological factors. So what I'm going to hopefully try and convince you today is the importance of considering fear of falling in your clinical practice. So I'd like to start at the end really and to start with some key take home messages that I'd like you to leave today's talk with. The first point is that fear of falling is worthy of our attention as clinicians and researchers working in the broad domain of falls prevention. The second important point is that fear of falling can be maladaptive with respect to balance and respect to fall risk, but this isn't always the case. And finally, this is a really important point, is that perceived control appears to be the key factor in whether or not fear of falling is ultimately maladaptive, whether or not it reduces safety, or whether or not it's adaptive, whether or not it actually has a protective effect. 
So why do I want to try and convince you of the importance of fear of falling? Well, firstly, it's highly common, okay? It's experienced by up to 50% of those aged 60 and over, and this number increases along with age. So this shoots up to about 85% of those aged 80 and over. High levels of fear of falling are also reported with people with Parkinson's disease, people who have experienced strokes, people with MS. So it's really, really common. If you're working with people who are at a high risk of falling, there is a good chance that they will experience fear of falling. It's also associated with a variety of negative outcomes. It's associated with reduced mental well-being, including increased depression, greater perceived vulnerability, increased loneliness. It's also associated with activity avoidance. So individuals who are fearful of falling will avoid engaging in activities in which they believe a fall is likely to occur. And this can then lead to deconditioning, which if you attended yesterday's fantastic lecture, you know is also associated with its own negative outcomes. Particularly important for, I guess, this kind of week on falls prevention, falls awareness, is that fear of falling is also associated with an increased risk for future falls. Note though that I have put a question mark at the end of this point. The reason for this is that Early work suggested a really clear cut relationship between fear of falling and falls. With the higher the level of fear, the greater your fall risk. But recent work has suggested that this relationship is actually far more complex. And this is what I'm going to really focus today's talk on, trying to really unpick the relationship between fear of falling and increased risk for falls. So before we go any further, it's quite important to actually define what we mean when we say fear of falling. So what is fear of falling? Well, it is essentially an emotional response to a perceived threat to balance. So then what causes it? What has to be present for an individual to experience fear of falling? Well, the first thing is that an individual needs to have the perception that their balance is threatened. So speaking to older people, some of the most common things that they believe or perceive to threaten their balance will be walking down steep stairs, walking down a steep hill, or walking across unstable, uneven or slippery surfaces. But the perception that balance is threatened alone is insufficient to trigger fear of falling. If I'm walking across a slippery surface, ice for instance, I'm aware that my balance is threatened, but I won't experience fear of falling. So then what else needs to be present for an individual to become fearful of falling when they perceive their balance to be threatened? Well, the individual then also needs to have the belief that harm, so a fall, is likely to occur in this given context. So then what makes fear of falling more likely? What makes it more likely that an individual will believe that harm is likely to occur when they perceive their balance to be threatened? Well, the most common thing would be this individual having experienced a previous fall or a near miss, so a trip, a stumble or a slip, where they manage to regain their balance at the last moment. But an individual can also have a belief that harm is likely to occur without having experienced a fall, because individuals can recognise that their balance isn't as good as it once was. They can recognise that maybe they're less stable on their feet. And this feeds into the belief that harm is likely to occur, leading to an increased likelihood that they will experience fear of falling when they perceive their balance to be threatened. Some of our recent qualitative research, which I'm going to talk about later, also highlights the importance of vicarious experience. So witnessing friends or family members falling and becoming injured. How this vicarious experience can also feed into this belief that harm is likely to occur when balance is threatened, leading to an increased likelihood that this individual will experience fear of falling. So as clinicians then, what is the best or easiest way to assess fear of falling? So there've been a number of different scales developed to try and achieve the same, but the one that I would recommend using would be the Fool's Efficacy Scale International. I recommend this for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is very easy to administer compared to some of the other scales, it's quite short and it's actually very easy to understand. Importantly, it's also highly reliable and it's also the most validated assessment to assess fear of falling. Importantly, it's also valid in a number of different contexts and populations. 
So it's been validated in community dwelling older people, it's been validated in people with movement disorders, so Parkinson's disease, strokes, MS. It's also valid in people living in the community. And there's also research, albeit less so, but research which suggests that it's also valid for individuals in acute or long-term care settings. So there are two versions of the Falls Efficacy Scale International. There's the full 16 item version and the shorter seven item version. So for clinical purposes, I recommend just using the short seven item version of the scale. It essentially gives you much of the same as the full 16 item scale does, but it takes about two thirds the time. So if you are not familiar with the short FBS or the short FESI, what this involves is seven different scenarios or seven different activities, and these are on the left. You then ask the individual to rate on a scale from one to four, with one being not at all concerned, four being very concerned, how concerned or fearful of fooling they would be if they were to engage in this activity. If the individual doesn't currently do the activity, then you just ask them to imagine how concerned or fearful they would be if they were to do this activity. You then sum the scores up for the seven different items, with then the higher the score, the greater the concerns or the greater the fear of fooling in that individual. Another reason I recommend this scale over others is because it is available free of charge in over 30 languages and it can be downloaded from the website there. So it's a seven item scale, but I am um, kind of appreciate that sometimes you will not have the time to do a full kind of assessment in kind of clinical practice. So other, there are other ways to assess fear falling that are shorter, specifically single item methods of assessment. The most common method for this would be asking an individual, in general, are you afraid of falling? The individual will then respond either not at all, a little, quite a lot, or very much so. Obviously, this has some positives. It's a single item, so it's very quick and very easy to administer. This will take probably about 20 seconds compared to two or three minutes, maybe for the short seven item FESI. There are a few downsides, unfortunately. The single item measures are less well validated compared to the FESI. They also provide less information about the nature of fear. So a nice thing with the FESI is it can give you a real nice overview of the specific activities or scenarios in which an individual does experience fear of falling, which can then be used to tailor rehabilitation strategies. In contrast, these single item assessments just give you a more kind of broad general snapshot of the, um, the frequency or the how common an individual will experience fear of falling. But that being said, if it's between the single item assessment or nothing, I still would recommend using a single item assessment because something is definitely going to be better than nothing. The most, well, probably one of the most important things I would like you to take away from today's talk, though, is that any assessment of fear of falling, it is crucial that you then also collect this in conjunction with an assessment of an individual's balance or physical fall risk. The reason for this, I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. So going back to the relationship between fear of falling and falls. So early work about 20 years ago now suggested a really clear relationship between fear of falling and falls. With the higher the level of fear, the greater the likelihood that an individual will fall. With then a fall, then feeding back into the level of fear of falling, which then further increases the likelihood of experiencing future falls. So in other words, an individual will then get trapped into this kind of negative spiral. The more recent research actually suggests that this relationship is far more complex. So it does suggest still that fear of falling can increase an individual's risk of falling, but only in those with good functional balance. In other words, only in individuals for whom fear of falling is excessive. If fear of falling matches the level of actual physical fall risk. So in other words, if this fear of falling is a realistic appraisal of an individual's balance limitations, then this work suggests that fear of falling can actually decrease an individual's risk of falling, okay? So fear of falling can increase fall risk, but only if it is excessive. So this is why I said it's really important to combine any assessment of fear of falling with a holistic assessment of an individual's balance and gait in other words, their physical risk of falling. 
because this will really help you put the level of fear that an individual experiences into context. This will help you understand whether any fear is a realistic appraisal of their full risk and then likely to have some sort of protective effects or whether or not the fear of falling is actually excessive and likely to reduce safety. Doing so will also help you identify individuals who are overconfident. So Kim Delbert, Stephen Lord and colleagues over in um, Sydney, from about in a really nice study in the BMJ about 12 years ago, found that a number of older people were overconfident. They didn't have fear of falling despite having quite bad balance. And they found that this overconfidence, this lack of fear of falling where there should have been some, also increase an individual's risk of falling. So it's really important, and I think this probably is one of the most important points of this talk today. It's super important to combine any assessment of fear of falling with an assessment of balance and gait and physical fall risk, because it's super crucial to actually put the level of fear into context. So as I said, there is some link between fear of falling and falls, it can in certain individuals increase the likelihood that they will experience a fall. So what mechanisms does fear of falling reduce safety? Well, traditional conceptualization suggested an indirect link with fear of falling leading to deconditioning, which then leads to poorer balance, which then leads to increased falls. So in other words, the link between fear of falling and falls was indirect and moderated through deconditioning. The more recent conceptualizations actually suggest a direct link between fear of falling and falls, suggesting that fear of falling might directly reduce safety by disrupting balance and disrupting gait. So in other words, individuals who are fearful of falling will alter their balance and alter their gait in unhelpful ways that reduce safety. But then this poses the obvious question, how exactly does fear of falling influence gait? And are these changes maladaptive? Do they reduce safety? or can they actually enhance safety? But there's been a lot of really nice work that's tried to answer this question. So work has been cross-sectional in nature, comparing individuals with versus individuals without fear of falling. But there's also been some really important experimental work where they bring older people into the lab and they then threaten their balance, typically by asking them to walk across unstable or uneven surfaces or raising them up at height and making them walk along the edge of these raised platforms. They've tried to threaten their balance to experimentally induce fear of falling and see how this leads to changes in gait and changes in balance. But a seminal paper by Kim Delbert and Stephen Lord and colleagues from about 15 years ago now did just this. They raised older people up at height and made them walk along the edge of this raised platform. And what they saw was individuals, when they became fearful of falling, adopted a more cautious gait pattern. They reduced their gait velocity, they widened their base of support. They took shorter steps and they increased the time spent with both feet planted on the floor. So the so-called double limb support strategy. Other research has also shown that individuals with fearful gait walk in a more stiff and less fluid manner. So what I mean by this is that individuals will reduce the joint movements. So for example, reduce the movement in the, the knee, the ankle, the hip joints. They will also increase the co-contraction of their lower leg muscles, so the muscles will be working harder. Fearful gait is also consciously controlled and cognitively demanding. So what do I mean by this? Well, research shows that individuals who are fearful of falling will switch from a predominantly automatic control strategy to one which is consciously controlled. They will direct their attention, they will focus their attention internally towards consciously monitoring and consciously controlling individual steps. But the million dollar question is then, are these changes in gait behavior protective or are they maladaptive? Do they increase safety or do they reduce safety when balance is threatened? So what I'm gonna argue throughout the rest of the presentation is that fear of falling is not inherently detrimental to safety. As long as it is proportionate to the threat faced or an individual's risk of falling. And some of our work I'm going to talk about later really highlights that some level of fear may actually enhance safety when balance is challenged or threatened. And we believe that this likely explains why fear of falling has a protective effect for certain individuals, as I talked about a few slides ago. But it's not all gold and fear of falling can reduce safety. Problems arise specifically when fear of falling triggers unhelpful cognitive responses, okay? 
So specifically, when fear of falling leads to worrisome thoughts, so if an individual is then worrying about a previous fall they've had, or worrying about then the consequences of what would happen if they were to fall, as well as a fear of falling leads to feelings of panic, so this kind of overwhelming emotional response. So why do these two aspects, these unhelpful cognitive responses, produce safety? Well, research shows, I'm going to talk about this next, that this can actually disrupt these fearful gate adaptations that would otherwise actually enhance and maximize safety. Because processing these worrisome thoughts essentially acts as a dual task. So it reduces the cognitive resources available for individuals to be able to actually make these changes to gate that would otherwise maximize and enhance their safety. Research also shows that these unhelpful cognitive responses, so these feelings of panic, this overwhelming emotional response, can also lead to gate adaptations that are excessive or unsuitable for the current context. So the commonly observed overly cautious gait patterns. Other research also suggests that these unhelpful cognitive responses may reduce safety when fearful of falling by disrupting movement planning. So when we're walking along, we use vision to look ahead and identify things in a path that might trip us up. Doing so then allows us to plan the adjustments we need to make to avoid, for example, tripping up or to avoid contacting an oncoming pedestrian. This is a problem, though, because research has shown that older adults seem to be at a high risk of falling. So those who have recently fallen will display less proactive visual search behaviours. They won't look ahead in their path. They will instead freeze their gaze towards the floor one or two steps ahead of where they are walking. And I'm sure you've all observed this. So, for example, if there is an older person who has recently fallen or an older person with balance problems, they will walk with their head fixated or their head kind of flexed downwards and their gaze fixated to the floor one or two steps ahead of where they are walking. This is a problem because this restricted visual planning behaviour has been shown to be causally associated with greater stepping errors and increased tripping. So this can directly reduce safety. In this previous work, these high-risk participants all reported greater fear of falling, which then led us to ask the question, OK, could fear of falling be driving these unsafe behaviours? And this is exactly what we wanted to try and answer with this uh, next study I'm going to talk about. So we brought 44 older people into their lab and we then stratified them. So we split them based on their fall risk, based on their recent falls, their functional balance, as well as their strength. We then had 24 low risk participants and 20 high risk gold rail participants. They completed this adaptive gait paradigm, which involved them having to step accurately into two targets. These targets had raised edges to then induce some degree of threat to balance. So if they didn't step accurately, there was a chance that they would trip. Participants completed all trials whilst wearing a head mounted eye tracker, which allowed us to see where they were looking to allow us to see essentially how well they were planning their future movements. So what we found is then when completing this task at ground level, low risk participants, as expected, were not fearful of falling at all, and they displayed proactive visual search behaviours. They were looking five, six, seven steps ahead. They were obtaining quite a rich, um, I guess, amount of visual information about their walking environment. They were planning well in advance. In contrast, these high risk participants reported high levels of fear of falling and they displayed the restrictive visual search behaviours that we predicted. They walked with their eyes fixed to the floor one or two steps ahead of where they were walking at any given time. We then wanted to try and see whether or not fear of falling might be causally driving these high risk behaviours. So we then had these low risk participants complete the identical paradigm, but this time whilst walking on a raised platform. They completed the same paradigm, but this time raised 0.6 metres above the lab floor, walking on a narrow walkway. As expected, these participants then became very fearful and they then adopted the identical visual search behaviours to which the high risk fearful participants had at ground level. They didn't look ahead, they weren't planning future actions and they restricted their gaze to the floor one or two steps ahead of where they were walking. Unsurprisingly, we found that this restricted visual planning was associated with significantly greater stepping errors. So participants were more likely to trip and catch their feet onto these um, into the, when stepping into these stepping targets if they hadn't looked ahead and planned the movements. 
But interestingly, though, this was only for the high risk participants. So the lowest participants, when we made them fearful of falling, once they reached these stepping targets that they hadn't planned the movements for, they then pause. They look down at these targets and they then obtained the visual information they needed to step accurately, and they did so. In contrast, the high risk participants didn't do this. They reached these stepping targets that they hadn't planned the movements for, and then they just kind of panicked. They just kind of threw themselves into the step, which then led to them catching their toes onto the uh, targets, catching their feet onto the targets, and led to significantly greater stepping errors. So these low risk participants were able to successfully adapt their behavior to overcome this pure planning. So this then posed a really interesting question. Why were these high risk participants unable to adapt their movement when they were fearful of falling? So to answer this question, we have to then ask essentially another question. What differences then exist between high and low risk older adults when they are fearful of falling? What are the main differences between what these individuals are thinking about? What are they kind of processing? What are the key differences here? So we then brought a different group of older people into the lab and we then asked them to tell us what they were thinking about, what thoughts were running through their mind when, they were, when their balance was threatened and they were fearful of falling. And we observed some quite marked differences here. Compared to only about 15% of the low risk participants, nearly 80% of the high risk participants will report focusing on worrisome thoughts when their balance is threatened and they are fearful of falling. Specifically, they told us they were well, they focused on ruminative thoughts, thoughts about their previous falls that they had had, as well as thoughts about and worries about the consequences of falling, for example, an injury. Now, we believe that processing these worrisome thoughts can really reduce safety through a few different mechanisms. Firstly, these then place substantial demands on cognitive resources. The individuals then have less resources available for carrying out and adjusting their behavior in any way needed to actually ensure safety when their balance is threatened. But one or two participants anecdotally also said that actually, no, these worries, actually they found them helpful. So then we wanted to then conduct a second study to really try and dig deep and try and find out if and why these worrisome thoughts might actually be reducing safety when individuals are fearful of falling and their balance is threatened. So to achieve the same, we then conducted a qualitative study. This has been recently published in Age and Aging. It's available open access. So if you are interested in learning more, please do find the paper because there's a lot of results in that. and I'm not going to talk about all of them today. But we conducted a qualitative study here to try and ask, answer the question, could worries about falling be a key driver behind maladaptive behavioural responses that reduce safety when fearful of falling. So we conducted in-depth interviews with 17 community dwelling older adults, all of whom reported experiencing worries about falling when their balance is threatened. So just some information there about the participants' demographics. I'm not going to go into this in too much information, but if you are interested in learning more, as I said, please do um, hunt down the paper. So we found a number of key results, but I'm going to focus on two today. The first result, which was quite surprising to us, was that most participants actually viewed worries about falling as being helpful. They viewed these as actually enhancing their safety. There was a caveat to this though, okay? This was only the case if preventing the worrisome fall was perceived to be within their locus of control. If this was the case, if individuals perceive themselves as having high levels of control over preventing the fall occurring, then when they experience fear of falling, this then drew their attention towards the threat to their balance. These worries then motivated them to make protective adjustments to their behaviour that actually enhance their safety. Participants spoke about how these worries motivated them to make sure they were lifting up their feet so they weren't going to catch their toes when they were, for example, stepping onto or off a curb. Participants also spoke about how these worries really motivated them to concentrate and focus on what they were doing so that they weren't distracted. Participants then spoke about how making these protective adjustments to their behaviour actually then reduced the fear of falling their experience when they were carrying out the task itself. And I think this is really nicely illustrated in this quote on the right. So as one participant said, I'm still at this stage where if I concentrate and apply myself, I can avoid a fall.
However, a number of participants also or viewed worries as actually being unhelpful. They viewed these as being disruptive to their safety and to their balance. This was specifically the case if preventing the worrisome fall was perceived as being outside of their locus of control. If this was the case, if individuals had low perceived control, then fear of falling triggered persistent worries that persisted during the task itself and also led to feelings of panic. So this kind of overwhelming emotional response. One participant described this as a really frightening feeling that everything was going to end. Participants spoke about how these persistent worries and thoughts and these feelings of panic actually then distracted them from being able to adapt their behavior in useful ways, to be able to adapt their behavior in ways that would enhance or maximize their safety in these situations that threaten their balance. As one participant said, all this worrying stopped me from being able to focus on what I need to do when walking. Participants also spoke about how these feelings of panic led to them making unsuitable or unhelpful behavioral adjustments. Participants spoke about freezing and hesitating. And this really does make sense because there's a lot of work that shows that making reactive balance adjustments, so for example, the rapid step needed to regain balance after slipping or if someone bumps into you, our reactive balance requires cognitive resources. If you're doing any other task, whether or not that is processing some thought in your head, so a worry about falling, for example, this then reduces your ability to make a quick and accurate re reactive step to regain your balance. So I think this really highlights how kind of low perceived control and the subsequent changes in cognitive processing, so these persistent worrisome thoughts and these feelings of panic can really actually reduce safety in situations where balance is threatened. So to summarize this kind of recent program of work, fear of falling may not be inherently detrimental to safety, as long as it is proportionate to the threat faced. And some level of fear might actually enhance safety when balance is challenged or threatened, because it might motivate the individual to actually make the behavioural adjustments needed to maximise safety when their balance is threatened. However, problems do arise and fear of falling can reduce safety, specifically in instances where fear triggers unhelpful cognitive responses, so strong negatively focused worrisome thoughts, so worrying about previous fall or worrying about the consequences of what would happen if you were to fall in this given context. Specifically, if these worries then persist during a task and lead to feelings of panic, so this kind of overwhelming emotional response. And our work here suggests that perceived control is a strong driver of whether fear of falling ultimately has a positive, so a protective or negative consequences essentially whether or not it enhances or whether or not it reduces safety when balance is threatened. And this really supports previous work which shows the importance of generalised perceived control with response to how experiencing a fall ultimately influences physical and mental well-being. So I'm a psychologist by background and we do love a good conceptual model. So this conceptual model was designed to really well conceptualise the key findings from this qualitative paper. So it is designed to try and describe the mechanisms through which fear of falling can reduce safety or enhance safety and identifying perceived control as a key moderator in this relationship. So if an individual has high perceived control, fear of falling then leads to protective adaptations to behaviour that are likely to actually enhance and maximise safety. Perceived control then also reduces the level of fear that an individual will have during the task itself. In contrast, if an individual has low perceived control, then when they are fearful of falling, this will then lead to persistent worrisome thoughts and feelings of panic when balance is threatened, which then lead to maladaptive or unhelpful changes to balance, which likely reduce safety and increase the likelihood of a fall occurring. There was also some evidence in this paper. Uh, I didn't talk about it now, but if you are interested, please do uh, find the paper. There was some evidence which suggested that low perceived control also feeds into this kind of excessive activity curtailment and likely increasing kind of deconditioning. So if you're interested in learning more about that, please do read the paper because I didn't have time to talk about this aspect of the results today. So from this program of work, there are a number of key recommendations, really. The first one is that 
aiming to indiscriminately reduce fear of falling may actually do more harm than good, given that fear can be both protective and maladaptive. It can both enhance safety and reduce it. Instead, we suggest that clinicians should actually be aware of the key drivers responsible for these negative outcomes. So the mechanisms through which fear of falling can actually reduce safety. Specifically, low perceived control and strong negatively focused worries that persist during the task itself. So persist when the individual is trying to actually negotiate the postural threat and these feelings of worries that lead to this kind of overwhelming emotional response, this panic response. We recommend that clinicians should only seek to directly target fear of falling itself in isolation. So I'm talking about targeting fear of falling through, for example, CBT, rather than kind of a holistic exercise and kind of CBT program. They should only do this if this fear of falling is clearly excessive. So if an individual has high falls efficacy scale scores, so high concern of fear of falling, combined with limited or no balance problems, because otherwise there is a chance that you might actually do more harm than good. So I'm just going to end today's talk. We're talking about a new scale that we have developed to help you as clinicians try to actually assess kind of perceived control. So the aim here was to try and develop a quick and clinically relevant tool to assess perceived control and associated feelings of kind of panic and associated persistent worrisome thoughts. So a scale does exist called the perceived control of falling scale. It's about 25 years old now. But importantly, though, this was never validated. And we conducted some focus groups with older people with a variety of balance problems, as well as clinicians working in the broad area of falls prevention, just to try and actually have get their feedback on this existing scale. And this feedback identified a number of problems with some of these items. There was one item which no one who we talked to could actually understand and asked, which is obviously a huge problem. If you're asking people to complete a scale which no one can really comprehend what is going on, that's obviously a big red flag. There was also another item which uh, wasn't worded in the clearest ways. So we use this feedback to remove this confusing item, to update this one that was a little bit unclear. And then also we use this feedback from the focus groups in conjunction with our qualitative results to develop a few new items which we believe to be really kind of relevant for this area. From this, we then created a new six item scale termed the updated perceived control over falling scale or the UPCOV. We then validated this so exploratory factor analysis in a sample of 209 community dwelling older people with a range of kind of different levels of balance, a range of different fear of falling and a range of different ages as well, importantly. From this validation, we then further refined the scale, resulting in a four item scale. We're really happy with this because we wanted it to be a quick and easy scale that could easily be just kind of slotted into kind of routine clinical practice. So this is what the scale looks like, our kind of upcov. So it has four different questions and then the participants just rate from strongly disagree to strongly agree how they have generally been feeling in recent weeks. There's some stats on the right from the validation. I'm not going to go into these in too kind of much detail, but the important points are that the test or the scale is reliable and has good internal consistency. And it does correlate with the FESI and the HAD, so the hostile anxiety and depression scale anxiety subscale as expected, but these aren't perfect correlations, suggesting that these aren't the same kind of constructs here, suggesting that it's kind of perceived control of falling does add something else kind of not measured by the FESI. If you are interested in kind of obtaining a copy of the scale, please do email me. My email's at the bottom there. It's also going to be on the final slide um, during question and answers. I'm happy to send the scale over as well as um, a brief kind of one page about the validation. So some of the kind of stats you can kind of uh, look at the reliability and stuff like this yourself. Finally, we've just also recently completed um, some stats to try and identify some cutoff points for identifying individuals with low perceived control. These stats are still ongoing, but it suggests that a score of 13 or under out of 20 is indicative of low perceived control. And what you can see here, so these individuals who are fearful of falling, so the three on the right, about 20% of these individuals kind of met this cutoff point. So we would argue that it's these 20% of fearful individuals for whom fear of falling is likely to actually reduce safety. Whereas the other kind of 80%, 75% or 80% of individuals, we suggest that fear of falling might actually here be having some sort of protective effect. 
So just to once again revisit the key take home messages that I mentioned at the start of this talk. Is that fear of falling leads to various kind of changes in gait behavior. But these changes may not be inherently detrimental to safety as long as they are proportionate to the threat based and individuals feel in control. In these instances, some level of fear may actually enhance safety when balance is challenged or threatened because it will motivate the individuals to actually make the changes to their walking behaviors or balance needed to really maximize safety in these given contexts. However, problems arise when fear occurs with low perceived control and then triggers unhelpful cognitive responses, specifically these persistent worrisome thoughts that then lead to these feelings of panic, this kind of overwhelming emotional response. So thank you very much for listening. Also, thank you to the sponsor of this research, uh, the ESRC, also the Wellcome Trust, uh, who are currently funding my current fellowship. As I said, my contact email is t.elmers, so e -L -L -M -E -R -S, at imperial.ac.uk. If you have any more questions that I'm not able to kind of get around to answering today, please do email me. Likewise, if you want a copy of the scale, please do email me. I'm also on Twitter, so that's at Toby underscore Elmers. I'm very active on Twitter, probably spend far too much time on it when I should probably be working. But if you want to kind of follow me and keep up to date with our recent work, um, kind of please do connect with me there. So yeah, thanks again for listening. And I think we now have time for some question and answers. That's uh, very, very, very detailed. And we've had a lot of um, chat going on in the Q&A. This is also a topic that's come up within the Falls Prevention Network, of which Toby is also a member. And we had a question from a colleague in Australia and I connected the two and they have a conversation about this very, very topic. So it's a uh, very, very important. And we've had some questions come up on the side. So if we start moving through Toby, mm -hmm. um, where are we? So is the scale i think that came up at the point uh, quite early on when you're down to the single point scale yep um is the scale good for assessing if a patient needs care at home is it something that can be, that can be integrated into that kind of assessment really good question um so this is quite a complex answer i'm afraid um it's, <laughs> you're not going to get you're not going to get a yes or no answer from me so as part of the World Falls guidelines, there was a lot of discussions about how to best assess fear of falling in long term care settings, acute care settings, how to assess it on discharge, how to assess whether or not an individual requires kind of care at home. Um, we suggest, if possible, still using kind of the seven, uh, the seven item FESI, because that will give you the most comprehensive kind of overview. But if this isn't possible, as I said, something is going to be better than nothing. So just asking kind of an individual how how kind of frequently they have been experiencing fear of falling in the past X number of weeks and then kind of getting them to um, respond on that kind of slider scale I gave there will give you some indication of how fearful they are of falling. But as I said, it is really important to then also assess and put this into context with their actual functional balance to actually try and identify whether or not the fear of falling is excessive or whether or not it is perhaps a realistic appraisal of their balance limitations. Because if it's a realistic appraisal of their balance limitations, then what this would suggest would be trying to actually target the poor balance rather than trying to directly target the fear of falling itself. Yes. Uh, another question coming up this, uh, earlier on was Meniere's disease. Any suggestions to, su to support individuals to leave the home if they have a, if they have a fear of falling because of their Meniere's disease? Oh, cool. good, 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 good question. Um, so obviously I'm now working in Centre for Vestibular Neurology in um, in Imperial. So we do work uh, quite often with people with balance balance problems. Um, I mean, Meniere's disease obviously. The, the attacks, well, often the times the kind of attacks are unpredictable, but they're not consistent. So um, I think kind of the key thing would be to try and actually manage the individual's kind of many years disease. Firstly, if that is kind of if that is managed and the attacks aren't frequent, then this might well be a case where CBT or psychological kind of um, interventions are the most appropriate, because from my experience, a lot of people with many years disease, their balance is OK unless they are having an attack. So that wouldn't these individuals probably wouldn't be um, most suitable for, for example, 
Tai Chi or yoga, which is some of the most um, supported ways to holistically reduce fear of falling, but rather because this individual's balance is good, unless they're having an attack, and the fear of falling is probably excessive, this is a case where maybe the kind of the CBT, psych kind of intervention is the most appropriate. Thank you. And we're following on from that one, sort of, is the respect of does research show that the fear of falling will reduce if physical ability and balance increase? Any tips to reduce the fear of falling? Yep. Um, so unfortunately, compared to other physical or physiological risk factors for falls, there's been a lot less focus on kind of how to effectively reduce fear of falling. So there isn't a wealth of well-designed kind of a low bias RCTs, but a recent um, systematic review and meta-analyses came out um, last year. Um, yeah, it was last year. It has Kim Del Bear in it somewhere. If you are interested, whoever's asked this question, please do email me and I can send you that paper. But what they found was that supervised exercise in the community was very, very effective specifically stuff that was more holistic. So things such as Tai Chi and yoga, Pilates, this type of things were really great for enhancing balance and also reducing fear of falling. So kind of holistic community-based exercise seems to be a very good approach for um, enhancing balance and having a knock-on effect that then kind of bringing fear of falling down as well. Kind of leads into tomorrow's talk by Dr. Emma Stanmore about um, Koku and keep up, keep moving. Uh, exactly. Keep up. Nice link, nice link. Yeah. <laughs> um, a couple of sort of related questions. Do you have any tips to help rehab patients whose fear of falling is so extreme that they panic during a sit to stand and walking by throwing themselves backward, causing a huge increase in the risk of falling? Yeah, whoever's asked this question, um, you are kind Anonymous. of. Anonymous. Oh, OK, you're kind of this is, I guess, music to my ears in terms of the importance of this kind of panic response, because we've we've all seen this kind of anecdotally, I think, kind of in the clinical working with people with kind of uh, at high risk of falling. But there's never really been um, anyone that's tried to kind of conceptualize this. So this is what we're hoping to do with this kind of this recent program of work and this recent kind of a perceived control of falling scale. So firstly, um, I'm quite happy to hear that this kind of that there is kind of, I guess, anecdotal clinical support for the importance of this. Less happy to hear, obviously, for the poor patients that this is kind of happening to. So um, this sounds like this is kind of another case where more sort of psychotherapies are going to be most appropriate here because the fear of falling is interfering with the physical rehab. So here you're not able to target the physical risk factors and bring fear of falling down accordingly because the individual is so fearful of falling that um, they're not uh, effectively engaging with the rehab strategies. So um, I know this differs from kind of trust to trust, but I'm aware of certain trusts that do then work with kind of um, geriatric psychiatrists, whether or not that is through kind of the IAP scheme or whether or not the kind of um, geriatrics department has a kind of a geriatric psychiatrist for whom kind of are working with on other, other areas. And I know that this has been implemented with success in the past. So that would be kind of my um, my current recommendation. But to follow that up, we are currently also trying to actually develop a short and easy uh, intervention to increase perceived control, reduce panic that can be then implemented alongside kind of routine kind of a PT and routine OT. So to kind of uh, so that these patients aren't then have to be kind of um, shuttled off to a geriatric psychiatrist so that we kind of within a single kind of rehab setting, we can then target the physical as well as the psychological risk factors for falls. But that is still unfortunately a couple of years off because we're kind of uh, still at the early stages of developing that. Thanks, Harry. I just a couple of questions similar along similar lines with the physical and psychological assessments and needs. Um, the experience of examples of integrating psychology and physiotherapy assessment. So it's, it's kind of a link there. There's another one, uh, someone's working in the acute setting. What can we do to improve patients' perception of control to try and decrease the risk of falls? Yeah, all, um, all great questions. In terms of integrating physical and psychological assessments, the psychological, as I, I would recommend the, the FESI just to get a general indication of their level of fear of falling. 
I know I'm biased because I created the scale, but I would also suggest the kind of the UPCOV because this does seem to be a really important kind of a component about whether or not fear of falling ultimately has a protective or um, kind of maladaptive effect with response to balance and falls. So that's probably the, the psychological aspects kind of done. And I mean, if we're talking about the kind of the seven item FESI and the four item UPCOV, that's 11 items. I mean, we've done that with um, kind of patients and it takes two minutes, two and a half minutes. So hopefully that's not too kind of um, too cumbersome or too much of a burden. Then in terms of the physiological or physical kind of risk factors, I'm not sure what um, kind of the routine kind of screening would be. I know it differs from kind of trust to trust. But probably something to assess their uh, their strength, whether or not that's kind of a hand grip strength. Things to assess their kind of uh, general uh, general lower body strength, so maybe a uh, kind of sit to stand test. Timed up and go to kind of get a general indication of their mobility and walking speed. Those things are probably going to give you a very good indication. Then if you have extra time, maybe something looking at kind of just static balance, whether or not that's kind of the Romberg test or, for example, the Berg balance scale. Those things are going to then give you a very good indication of the individual's physical fall risk. It will give you quite a holistic uh, appraisal of um, their kind of physical functioning, which will then really help allow you to kind of put any fear of falling that they do have in context of their actual kind of physical fall risk. And then from that, you can then probably best understand how to give them the treatment they need. If, they're, if they have high fear of falling combined with kind of poor balance, and that would suggest kind of a holistic sort of exercise kind of program would be most appropriate to then actually enhance their balance and then bring down fear of falling kind of um, as a consequence. If their balance is okay and their fear of falling is very high, then this would suggest directly targeting the fear of falling. Likewise, if they're kind of, they have very low perceived control, this would then also suggest directly targeting these kind of maladaptive kind of uh, cognitive uh, constructs and cognitive responses to the perceived threat and to the fear of falling. Now to follow on, in terms of any current tips for um, reducing or enhancing perceived control, uh, as I mentioned, we are currently trying to actually develop a uh, psycho, like a psychological intervention that can be integrated alongside routine practice. This will be a key component of this. So kind of um, short answer is watch your space. But what we are currently kind of doing is actually having a discussion with the individuals to try and work out why they have low perceived control. So, for example, one uh, patient I worked with had very low perceived control, and this was due to having experienced multiple falls in the past where that weren't, in her words, her fault. So people rushing out of shops and bumping into her, people knocking into her from behind. These were things that she didn't believe she could do anything to prevent. So therefore, when she was in a very busy environment where she kind of believed something similar could happen, she had very low perceived control and really kind of stiffen up and freeze doing things that paradoxically would actually kind of reduce her ability to make these kind of rapid reactionary steps and regain her balance. So with her, we kind of work to actually try to firstly um, directly train this reactive balance because that was the aspect that she believed she had low kind of control with. And then also work with her to try and actually increase her kind of uh, perceived control around this. So we kind of spoke with her about, OK, how likely so how likely is it that someone is going to bump into you? How many times has this happened? OK, it's happened twice over the past four years. OK, is this therefore very likely to happen? Probably not. And then kind of working with her to try and actually educate her about how the changes to her behaviour that she was doing, so it's really stiffening up and kind of uh, tensing her muscles, how this is likely to actually reduce her safety and then paradoxically increase her risk of falling. So essentially kind of working to try and I guess target the physical aspect which they kind of don't have control over or don't perceive themselves having control over preventing as well as in kind of doing some sort of psychotherapy to try and kind of educate them and try and kind of a challenge their belief system seems to be effective but as I said um, there isn't any we haven't published any of this evidence yet and we are currently developing a kind of a structured way to target this so please do watch your space. Thanks, so a couple more questions. Um, there's one here about steep stairs and mm. a uh, being a particular cause of fear of falling due to due to the stair use of perception and potential harm that this could occur. Does existing research support this or is it anecdotal based on the field work you've carried out? Now, I will hasten to add that's from Rich Foster, who's a senior lecturer in biomechanics at John Moores. Maybe your academics could take that one offline. 
oh that's rich okay i'm, I'm good friends with rich yeah okay you can, <laughs> you can mess with me after rich <laughs> yeah okay cool i uh, move on to tanya um tanya works for an organization called heart for chair independent living oh gosh Hertfordshire Independent Living Services and we do an exercise programme with chair-based exercises and Otago strength and balance exercises with clients in their homes. Is there anything else that we should be looking at in terms of walking stroke gait exercises? We look more directly at the exercises but other than, other than CBT is there anything else that can be done with the fear of falling that we can refer clients to? Um, yeah, so I guess this kind of comes back to the question, uh, the, the response I made earlier. There isn't, unfortunately, too much um, high quality evidence about how to as I said, reduce fear of falling. But some of this work does suggest that kind of more holistic um, programs such as Tai Chi, yoga, Pilates can be very effective, especially if these are kind of done um, within the community, the community setting and done by kind of a trained expert. We're not 100% too sure of why, the mechanisms why kind of community works best than kind of individual one-to-one, -one. Uh, but it probably has something to do with kind of vicarious experience and kind of um, uh, kind of uh, collective self-efficacy, these types of things. So I would recommend um, things such as that, to be honest with you, because unless, as I said, unless you have someone for whom the fear falling is excessive, or you have someone who has low perceived control, then directly targeting the fear of falling through, for example, CBT could do more harm than good. So my recommendation would always be to try and actually, um, unless you are convinced or certain that there is, that, that some of the fear of falling or perceived control is uh, excessive or excessively low in respect to perceived control, then I would always recommend targeting balance and then kind of, because then from that you can expect these kind of psychological constructs to fall in line accordingly. Following on from that with CBT, some uh, anonymous, there's a lot of anonymous people. Uh, do you work with OTs or physios as CBT does not always work for everyone? I think you kind of sort of covered that ish, didn't you? Yeah, um, I, I mean, of course, CBT definitely won't work for everyone. And I guess that is a big reason why we are interested in kind of trying to develop some sort of integrated physical and psychological kind of intervention, just so you, we can kind of um, within the rehab setting, kind of implement some sort of psychological aspects so that you can kind of target the physical and the psychological kind of a, in a combined holistic manner because they are so interrelated. If you're kind of uh, trying to target them both in isolation, there's probably um, not much, well, you're going to have a lot uh, less uh, effectiveness than actually if you're kind of uh, targeting them holistically. Thank you. Um, Got a couple more questions. There's one. There's yeah, anonymous again. It's a personal question, a, a technical one. So I, I think it might be an idea if they use your email address and or mine to get in touch with each other. Um, we've got a physio here saying it's great in working health. Addressing fear of falling has been our role for many years. Yet the importance of the physio role in mental health services, linking the mental and physical health needs of patients, is not always recognised by the wider team. That's been liked by a few people as well. Yeah, com completely agree. And I think, I mean, this kind of, I guess, separation between the physical and the mental health, it never works, right? Like, I mean, nothing work like these things do not occur in isolation and they kind of uh, often have a reciprocal relationship. So I think kind of targeting either of those in isolation, if there is a problem with both, you're never going to get effective results. We're going to get far less effective results than if you kind of actually kind of uh, take a more holistic approach. Cool. Um, I think we nearly run to the end of the questions, actually, Toby. One more, which was could teaching techniques and strategies to to people getting up from and down to the floor improve the confidence and improve the fear of falling? Yep, definitely. Um, quick answer. Yeah, this, uh, yeah, hundred. That's the quickest answer you've done, Toby. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's the <laughs> the, the, the one that. Um, yeah, yes. Essentially, uh, the quality uh, in the qualitative work I spoke about. Almost every participant I spoke to, a lot of their worries were specifically about that. What happens if I fall and I can't get up? Um, and a lot of people who I spoke to as well, 
said that unfortunately this wasn't something that they were ever taught even when they were kind of uh they went to a falls clinic post fall or if they were taught it they kind of um they didn't find it was as effective as it needed to be so i think yes 100 percent kind of teaching people how to i guess kind of fall safely and then also teaching people how to get up from the floor will do kind of wonders for kind of perceived control and wonders for kind of excessive potentially unhelpful fear of falling definitely Following on from the exercise kind of things, it's Paul, Paul Mills. That may be Paul Mills from uh, Tuesday's talk. Um, he says, could seated exercises be beneficial to offset the fear of falling during exercise? So seated exercises, would they help? Uh, I mean, OK, this is now a, you're not going to get a quick answer on this, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> so, <one> minute over. <laughs> <laughs> OK, right, let's write in 30 seconds. Um, short answer if i'm being honest probably not simply because this kind of uh the ask the the uh systematic review and meta-analysis suggested it does need to be kind of you need standing stuff you need to kind of um train the system exercise, train the balance muscles. system to kind of essentially so the individual then can recognize that hang on my balance is actually a bit better than i thought it was or they can then actually track that their balance is improving over time so obviously i'm aware that some individuals this isn't really kind of um capable for but i think if the individuals can do standing exercises that is going to be have the best impact in terms of reducing fear of falling fantastic that was pretty short <laughs> <laughs> well i think that's pretty much come to the end of all the uh questions in the q a box so Nothing further me to say, but thank you very, very much, Toby. It's been a, a privilege to hear you. And at last, long last, to finally see you because we've only ever exchanged, as is the day of these, of these worlds, uh, we exchanged message by email. Um, so thank you very much for everyone who attended. I think we broke the 300 barrier, so you, you're in good territory there, Toby. <laughs> and um, I would do the numbers afterwards. But don't forget, everyone, if there's anybody left here now, then we've got one more uh, webinar tomorrow, same time, same place, my yellow room. Um, and that will be with Dr. Emma Stanmore from Manchester University talking about Koku. Keep on, keep up. So have a great Falls Awareness Week, everyone. Loving seeing all the activity on Twitter and thank you very much for your time. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everyone. You're welcome. <laughs>